So superheroes, of course, are a big thing in pop culture for the past couple decades now. Uh, and let me just start by asking a real easy question to get us thinking again about the passage. Why do you think the story and idea of superheroes appeals to people? What about that do you think connects with people? Why do people so easily get into the stories and ideas of fictitious superheroes? And kids, feel free to contribute to this as well. Cheryl? Because we like to see good triumph over evil. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's one of the biggest ones, Cheryl. You hit the nail on the head. We like to see good triumph over evil. <clears throat> and we don't, of course, want to embrace everything in popular culture, right? But we can also affirm good things. That's probably a desire that God himself has put into our hearts, right? To see good and justice triumph over evil. Absolutely. Am I too loud? I feel like I'm ringing a little bit. A little bit? Okay, I'll turn that down a little bit. Uh, anything else? Why do we like superheroes? Helen? Well, I think people like to feel safe, and with superheroes conquering evil, they do feel safe. They, they, it's a form of a savior, perhaps. Hmm. That's really insightful, too, Helen. Thank you. Um, that desire for a superhero, right? Well, I should, a desire for a savior, someone who can actually fix the problems. And the problem with most of our everyday heroes, right, is they don't have the ability to fix the problems, whereas the superhero has that special extra something, that power, that character. Um, my wife's favorite superhero is Captain America, and um, she's very patriotic, so that's probably one reason. But another reason she loves Captain America is not because he's the biggest and best superhero around, but because of his moral quality. He's very, very strong in many moral ways that sets him apart from many other characters. So absolutely, Helen, um, uh, we look for that savior idea, and we like that, and that's probably a, biblic uh, a thing God has put into our hearts as well. Alex? <laughs> Our sense of justice dictates that we like to see the bad guy lose mm. and punished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We long for that justice, right? We long for the, the evil to be judged and for good to, to win and be blessed. Absolutely. That's certainly a biblical value, too. Okay. And we try to live vicariously through these, these heroes because they have uh, uh, powers that we wish we had. And I think um, some people wish they could be those, those heroes. And in reality, they see the, the grind of everyday life, and, and we think uh, we're not even close. We have, they have it great, and we don't. So. That's very insightful. Um, and so there's the danger, right? The danger would be, uh, um, the danger would be that you know, we overinvest in these fictional stories, right? We live vicariously through them. We allow their, those stories to make us forget the reality of what we're facing. Um, and so and that's a danger as well. And like you said, we, even for ourselves, we long for something greater. Or we long to be important. Um, and of course, there's, there's, a, there's a good desire to be good and have an impact, right? But then just to want our own greatness, right? It's not a good either. So that's very good and very insightful too. Um, well, that's great. Let's 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 pause on thoughts on that for a moment as as we just get into the text. Um, and Amelia and I, you know, of course, people have different opinions on things, and that's absolutely fine. Um, Amelia and I enjoy, you know, superhero movies. We enjoy superhero stories. So when we have time to watch things, that's one thing we'll sometimes watch together. And one very very well known hero, of course, is the Marvel hero Thor with his hammer. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that image. And the thing that makes Thor unique is he has this hammer that no one can wield except one who is worthy, right? And so if anybody tries to pick up this hammer, it's just impossibly heavy, and it will, oh, there we go, I can hear myself. Impossibly, that was perfect timing, too. Uh, impossibly heavy, and the hammer will just, you know, go to the ground. Nobody can even hope to budget except for one who is worthy. Um, and... Uh, and so that's one thing that sets him apart. And in one of the recent stories they told, and in one of the films in the past couple of years, um, you have Thor himself actually lose his worthiness. He is, he's arrogant, he's brash, he's uh, insensitive, he's all about himself, and he loses his worthiness of picking up the hammer, and he loses that for most of the story. And it's only towards the end of the story, as he's grown in character, and towards the very end when he's willing to even sacrifice himself to save those around him, 
him um, that he again becomes worthy to wield the hammer and of course is able to save uh, everyone at the last minute. Now, <clears throat> of course, we're talking, you know, silly pop culture things, so let's get serious for a moment then. While we think Thor's, <laughs> Thor's hypothetical hammer might be very heavy, too heavy, what about the weight of God's justice? What about the weight of God's glory? What about his righteousness, his power, his judgment, and his kingdom? How heavy are those things? How impossible are those things to hold and wield? And our problem as humans, as we recognize even as we watch these stories, is that we are unworthy, aren't we? Ever since Adam and Eve, the first human, sinned, we cannot bear the weight of God's righteousness, justice, power, wrath, and glory. We as people had God's kingdom, but we lost it. And ever since then, no one has been found worthy to rescue and redeem. Not Noah, not the great prophet Moses, not even the greatest king in Israel, King David, was worthy to fully bring back God's kingdom. In fact, no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth can be found who is worthy except one, isn't that right? Except the one who really can wield the weight and the glory of all these things, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lamb, who was slain. So let's pick up the story there then. In the text, we had talked a lot about the image of the lamb that was slain, and that's where we had ended uh, in Revelation 5 last time we gathered. A couple images we didn't necessarily talk about, though, that I'll just wrap, wrap up with this, this piece. We were told he has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. So the biblical image of horns comes up a lot. And um, does anybody remember what horns usually represented in that culture? Kathy? Power. Yes, power, strength. Um, the image I like to use is on my mother's side. The, the family was very into hunting uh, in New Jersey, and so all, all of the boys on that side of the family were hunters. Um, and of course, when you, you get your game uh, and you bring it back, what's the piece that they always want to mount on the wall? What's the most important thing? It's not even the head, right? It's the, the horns, right? How many horns does it have? Because the horns represent strength and power and something unique and special. And so it was the same thing. Here, Christ has seven horns. And of course, we know seven represents all power, right? And all authority and all honor. And then uh, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. And like we have said before in Revelation, this probably represents the sevenfold Holy Spirit, the perfect spirit. Though if, if the idea was, you know, the angels of God or something like that, then the message would be, still be very similar um, either way. Tom Schreiner says this, the key to unlocking history is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he is the one that is worthy. He is the one that is opening, the, ready to open the scroll to unlock history. And just as a refresher, before we move on to the next section, and I ask you some questions, um, of everything we've looked at up to this point, Tim Chester says this, nothing could be more subversive. Instead of the mighty beasts of imperial power, we have a lamb. Instead of a victorious general, we have one who has been slain. Instead of the power and glory and wisdom of an empire, we have the weakness and shame and folly of the cross. But it's, fo it's the folly and weakness of the cross that has conquered. The king reigns from the cross. The lamb has all strength, symbolized by seven horns, and all knowledge, symbolized by seven eyes, and is all present, the seven spirits or sevenfold spirit. He receives the worship of heaven because by his blood he has ransomed people for God. So that's a great summary of that whole section. And remember, it's the lamb standing as though slain. He, he is alive, he is standing, and he continues as the one slain, and that is, that is how he redeems us and, uh, and that how, is how his work of redemption continues. Okay, so now let's focus in on a section we haven't looked at yet, which is these new songs of praise. That is the second half of this chapter. So let me just reread verses 8 through 10, and then um, you can share any thoughts you have. So as we read, be looking. What are you noticing about the response to the Lamb taking the scroll, and what can we learn from this? So here's verses 8 through 10 of Revelation 5. <clears throat> 
And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So this response and this first uh, song, what are some things we noticed about that as we read through it together? Alex? I'm referring back to verse 1 where... The Lord takes the scroll for the Father. Hmm. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. He takes it from the Father himself, which of course is just adds gravity to that, right? It's in the hand of the Father himself, so somebody really worthy has to be the one to take it. Is that, that where you're going with your thoughts, Alex? Okay. Good. Good. Kathy? I was struck by the irony uh, number one, that it um, it was through death that we have life. Mm. So I see the resurrection of this slain lamb. I see the irony of that, that even, even we will overcome through a similar thing, through suffering and death. Mm. I also see the meekness of the lamb and yet the majesty of who he is and all his worth. Mm. So there's these, I don't know, this tension between these two contradictory things mm. meekness and yet majestic mm -hmm. and powerful and sovereign it's glorious mm -hmm. and what a great description of our one and only savior right because we usually can't hold these things together we should be able to right but we can't right we can't we can't be meek and powerful at the same time where we really struggle with that right power um make fills us with pride uh, or, or meekness can sometimes make us think that we, you know, don't have power to exercise or something like that. So yes, absolutely. Mike? Zeroing in on the last verse you read, there's inclusiveness mm -hmm. and completeness. Mm -hmm. We will be left to rule. We will be left to not just survive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's his choice for that. It's not ours. It's mm -hmm. our, it's our uh, participation in his will and his directives for, to be included and to be completed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Yes, that promise of they shall reign on the earth. And then he, he's encompassing all believers in this, in this promise. And then it's also all of the earth is going to be the scope of the rain. So absolutely, Mike. Very good. Very good. Aaron? Go ahead. Just, just struck again, and we probably said this last week, but just struck again with the, the reality that, um, that there was no one initially found worthy. Mm -hmm. And so they had this sense of, um, of sorrow. Mm -hmm. And even John himself, he was weeping mm -hmm. because there was no one found worthy. Mm -hmm. And it seems like our rejoicing in Christ's worthiness is so much greater when we first see the need mm -hmm. and the big, mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't know, I guess, need mm -hmm. for, for a savior mm -hmm. and for someone who's worthy and realize that there is only one mm -hmm. who could ever possibly mm -hmm. fill that position and that that just seems like it it just spontaneously mm -hmm. almost generates this song and mm -hmm. this praise to realize that wow we actually do have someone who's worthy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's wonderful that John, and of course, the Holy Spirit, but John, you know, takes this time to set us up, right? Because you're right, Aaron. I, I, I didn't think about that. The, the setup really makes us feel the weight of the importance of this. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and, and it's even a picture of the gospel, right? Only when we understand our need for Christ's work and salvation and mediation and forgiveness only then can we appreciate and respond appropriately, right? And so here we see the need for one who is worthy, and then people can appreciate and respond. And of course, what's the response? Uh, 
uh, immediately he takes the, the, the scroll from him who is seated on the throne, as Alex just pointed out, and the four living creatures and the 24 elders, what do they do? They fall down. They prostrate themselves in worship and in joy and in wonder. And then, of course, what do they do? They break out in worship, right? They break out in worship. This is what the work of Christ Jesus does to us and to those who, who see it and understand it for what it is. So, good, good. Amen. Kathy? We so often see the references back to Exodus, to Daniel, mm -hmm. and all these other Old Testament books in regards to, you know, the plagues and the bad things. But Exodus 19.5 mm. says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests mm. and a holy nation. Mm. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So this is also fulfillment of Old Testament scripture mm. here, too. Mm. These were promises given to us long, long ago. Mm. Well, and that is, that's, that's not long after the Exodus, right, Kathy? Um, so, right, that great work of redemption God did in the Old Testament, right, the Exodus, that great mo saving moment, um, what was started and in a sense partly accomplished then has now been expanded to the all, 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 all people, all tribes, all languages. So that's, that's good. That's a wonderful connection especially for that phrase, you're right. Uh, and again, if you go back and read Daniel 7, you'll see a lot of connections between chapters 4 and chapters 5 and Daniel 7 too. There's a lot of image, imagery that John is definitely drawing from. Um, Helen. Mine is more a question on interpretation. It says, for you were slain and by your blood you ran ransomed. Wait a minute, let's start again. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. So my question to you is, was he worthy because he did this for God, hmm. or was he worthy because he did it for us to come to God? Hmm. Was he following God's will, and that's what made him worthy? Mm -hmm. Wow, Helen, what a question. <laughs> I wish I had an answer for you right away, but I, I don't know if I, I I'll think about that one. You gotta give me five minutes on that one. That's a good one. Hmm, anyone want to share any thoughts in response to her question while I try to think of an answer? Mike. Could I suppose one word in between for whom did he, was he worthy? And that would be obedience. Hmm. He obeyed the Father's will. Hmm. And it affected and it affected both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Um, I'm just reminded too where he was given a scroll that sort of represents both a will mm. of inheritance of some kind. But what's interesting about Christ is he becomes the executor of the will, but also the inheritor of it. The inheritance, mm. which are the people of God, are given to Christ as his bride. So it's just so connected that her question was so wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. just, what was it? And, it? and it really must be all of it. Mm -hmm. It really has to mm -hmm. be. Because he is that one who accomplished everything, and yet he's the one that is given everything, and all the glory mm -hmm. is going to go to him, and we become his bride, which is another point about the hero. Mm -hmm. Very often the hero is also the romantic you know, Prince Charming that comes and arrives on the scene. And what do we have in Revelation? We have a marriage feast of the mm -hmm. Lamb. Mm -hmm. So th there's a lot of connections here. It's mm -hmm. so full. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, Kathy. And maybe we shouldn't try too hard to define, right? That's good. Uh, that, that's helpful because sometimes we try too hard to make be specific. Um, I think what I would say, Helen, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but it, it specifically points to the actions of Christ here, right? Um, why is he worthy to take this scroll? He was slain, and then he has ransomed people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So I guess maybe um, one of the big ideas we need to understand, and, and I think like we said last time, this scroll probably has connections to the book of Daniel, right? Daniel chapter 12, and Daniel being told to seal God's um, last day plans until the time, the time has come. Um, and so only through the work of Christ on the cross, only through his death, um, only through his resurrection can he 
um, initiate not only God's plan for judgment, but God's plan for salvation. Those things were held back. Those things were prevented until the death and resurrection of Christ allowed them to move forward. So, so it's really helping us understand the, the pivotal um, necessity of what Christ did. So I don't know if that really answers your question. That's a great question. We could spend a lot more time talking about it too, I think. Um, but okay, good. Terry? I see why they're rejoicing because they know that evil and wickedness on this earth is coming to an end. Mm. So that's something to rejoice mm. about. Amen. Thank you. God's salvation always prompts rejoicing. Dave, <laughs> Meredith, we're giving you a real workout. Good job. Okay, good. Okay. I don't have to eat it, honey. <laughs> Listen, I look at this, and, you know, and, and to, it, in response to Helen, my version happens to just say re- redeemed, hmm. and it immediately made me respond to, uh, in a simple version would be, why do we share the Lord's Supper? Because God was there, yes, but he's, he was angry at sacrifices. He sent his the perfect sacrifice for us. Mm-hmm. So that's where it talks about being redeemed through the blood. And, and, Jesus, and it just refers to us sharing the Lord's Supper. What do we lift up? Mm-hmm. It was the perfect sacrifice sent to redeem us back to God the Father. Mm-hmm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's what we celebrate every time we take you the Lord's Supper. Exactly. By his blood. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, and as we wrap up our time, let's just draw our last um, thoughts and reflections on this text. And for those who are, who are listening in now or later, apologize for the couple cutouts we've had here and there. Um, okay. So uh, just a couple things. Uh, notice the the bowls of incense being held by the 24 elders. Um, incense often in the Old and New Testament represents prayers. So that's just a detail there. Also holding the harps. I think this is probably part of the reason we get some of those, you know, stereotypical heaven images of people with harps and stuff like that. Um, uh, everybody becoming an angel with wings and harps isn't exactly a biblical image, right? But here's, here's probably where some of the harps come from. Of course, a, uh, an instrument used uh, in the Old Testament a lot. And for those who say that instruments have no place in the worship of God, according to the New Testament, well, here's a, here's a text that we could talk about a little bit. Uh, okay, and uh, probably some of you noticed this. It says that they sang a new song Uh, which is interesting. What does that mean? Um, Well, of course, we all understand what the meaning of new is. And uh, in historical context, new songs were often used for special occasions. So maybe you had the coronation of a new king, right? Or the celebration of a great victory. Uh, And of course, you know, in, um, in, even biblical terms, right? We had the, the crossing of the Red Sea, right? In Exodus. And then we have the song of Moses and Mary, right, right after a new song praising God's redemptive work. And so probably here again, we have a song celebrating the new covenant, the new redemptive acts wrought by Christ. And, um, and of course, this is a, a new and even greater than the old, than the old song. The old uh, song had seen Israel become a kingdom of priests. The new song sees Jews and Gentiles, peoples from across the world, become a kingdom of priests. The old song redeemed one nation, but the new song redeems people from every tribe and nation. Um, so this is a new, wonderful, joyous song. Oh, and here's a, here's a cool quote. So for those of you who are history nerds like me, you'll probably appreciate this. So this is a quote from Victorinus of Petovium. That's a mouthful. Um, he, lived, he wrote this around 300 AD. So this is actually from the earliest commentary we have on Revelation, which is pretty cool, and only about 200 years after the finishing of the New Testament. So quite close. So here's what he says. 
The 24 elders and the four animals had harps and bowls and were singing a new song. The preaching of the Old Testament joined with the new reveals the Christian people singing a new song that is proclaiming their public confession. It is new that the Son of God became man. It is new that he was given over into death by men. It is new that he rose again on the third day. It is new that he ascended in the body into heaven. It is new that he gives the forgiveness of sins to men. It is new that men are sealed with the Holy Spirit. It is new that they receive the priestly service of supplication and await a kingdom of such immense promises. It's like, wow, Victorinus, why don't you come and, uh, you know, give us a message or something like that. Pretty cool. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, for the rest of the chapter, we see this song expands. Remember, the songs have been expanding even since chapter 4. We have the 24 elders and the four living creatures sing, and then he looks, and around the throne and the living creatures, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And so this is just exploding in scope. Um, and the numbers here are really, um, 10,000 is the largest number in Greek that was easy to express. So he's, he's saying 10,000 times 10,000, which of course is a um, 100 million, and 1,000 times 1,000 is a million. And he's probably not trying to be specific, right? He's just trying to communicate the awe and the grandeur and the splendor of God's glory and the heavenly host in this song. So the biggest number you can think of, that's what he's trying to make us, us think of. And then, uh, of course, the third song, and let's focus in here then on verse 13, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. So now all of creation joins in the song, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Now let's focus in on that last song. So here's our last uh, probably question for today. What do you notice about that last song? Um, once you notice it, it stands out like a, um, like a flag. <laughs> the, the lamb is receiving blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever, but he's not the only one receiving. Who else is receiving that? The one who sits on the throne. So what is this saying? God the Father and the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, are both together equally receiving blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen? So a very strong statement, Trinitarian statement, statement on the deity of Christ himself. He is worthy of every blessing and honor that even the Father himself is worthy of. Amen. Okay, so let's wrap up here then. Um, how do we apply these couple chapters? Well, besides hopefully being just um, thrown to the floor by a look at the majesty and glory of God and Christ and the work of redemption that he has done, in many ways, this chapter also makes us apply and think of the words that Paul himself expressed in Philippians chapter 2. So let me read a passage that's very familiar to you as kind of our application as we end today. Paul says, Christians, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, so if our Savior was willing to humble himself, was willing to suffer, was willing to give of himself and his very life to accomplish the will of the Father, how much more should we be willing to follow in his great footsteps and, and accept the things the Lord puts before us and be willing to suffer and, and endure hardship for the sake of his name because we know for those who do overcome and have the victory, theirs will be the crown of life. Theirs will be um, the resurrection promises. They will be exalted. Um, uh, with along with their Lord. And that's a wonderful hope. 
So, and let's just close with, close with a quote here from a very uh, well-known hymn. I don't even have to introduce it, but here are the lyrics. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Amen. Okay, let's pray and then get ready for service. Lord, um, all blessing and honor and glory and power really do belong to you. Um, it feels odd even to, to read these words and to think about these things without being on our knees, Lord, um, as the heavenly host is. Um, you are worthy of every, every good thing. You are the one who is worthy to rescue and redeem. You are the one we've waited for and longed for. Um, and Lord, let that fill us with hope this morning as we worship you and then as we go and face the challenges that, that, that have been put before us. Um, let us be filled with hope that, yes, you too also suffered. You too also had to endure hardship, even to the point of death. And yet yours was the victory. Yours was the redemption. Yours was the crown. Uh, and that is the promised hope that we have too. May we faithfully follow in our footstep, in your footsteps. May we faithfully worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. And we love you and we thank you. Thank you for this time. In your precious name, amen.